Hey there. Hey there, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Happy 2022. Happy New Year to everyone watching. Happy New Moon in Aquarius. Happy Black History Month. Woohoo! <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ola, and um, I am a set decorator for film and TV. I am a yoga teacher, I am a visual artist, I am a mom, and I am also the creator and director of a social art project called the Free Black Woman's Library. So, the Free, the Free Black Woman's Library is a project that features a couple of different things, the first one being a collection of over 4,000 books, all written by black women, black femmes, and black non-binary folks. I think we have almost 5,000 books at this point. I stopped counting at 4,000 because it just became too much. And the project also features public programming that comes in the form of workshops, um, conversations about books, cultural presentations, self-defense classes, and it also features a mutual aid initiative for single mothers and a reading club. Now, the reading club meets on the first and first and last Sunday of every month, and we meet over Zoom. So if you're interested in joining our reading club, definitely all are welcome. This month, we are reading Sisters of the Yam by Bell Hooks. I will be talking about that on Sunday the 6th. And we are also reading Butter Honey Pig Bread, a debut novel written by um, Francis Ex Francesca Equiaki. And we're going to be talking about that book on the last Sunday of the month. So, And she's going to be joining us for that conversation. Actually, Francesca will be in the house, in the Zoom house. <laughs> so... Yeah, the one of the really cool things about the Reading Club is that we get to meet the authors of the books that we're reading. For instance, last year we read Somebody's Daughter, which is a memoir by Ashley C. Ford. Brilliant memoir. And Ashley actually came by to the Reading Club, the Zoom room, and spoke to us. Uh, we also read Liberty another excellent book uh, written by Caitlin Greenwich. This, that one is fiction. And Caitlin came by and spoke to us. Uh, we read The Other Black Girl. And we got to meet Zakia. We read Call Baby. And we got to talk to Morgan Jerkins. So, yeah. Um, I could talk about The Reading Club forever uh, because it's just been so much fun. And part of what being in a pandemic has caused is for us to meet over Zoom. And as a result, we have people from all over the world that get to come to our reading club. So even though the pandemic is like this scary, frightening thing, it's actually uh, giving birth to some new ways of us building community online. And so there are pros, no, there's no pros to a pandemic. Um, there are pros to virtual meetings. That's what I'll say, because we have people from Greece and people from South Africa, and people from Amsterdam, and people from Brazil, and people from Philly, and people from Cali, and people from New York, all meeting over Zoom to talk about black women and feminism. So it's great, and you're welcome to come. But anywho, enough about the reading club. Um, the other thing that I started in addition to the library is a yearly reading challenge. It's the free Black Women's Library Reading Challenge, where I invite people to read 25 books written by Black women, Black femmes, or Black non-binary folks. Now, here's the thing. If 25 books feels like too much for you, that's fine. Don't feel pressured to read 25 books. Um, create your own goals. Set your own standards, right? The idea behind the challenge is just to get people reading more and also to kind of like step out of your reading comfort zone. So let's say, for instance, somebody like me, I used to read nothing but science fiction and black feminist theory, period, right? But what the challenge does is I created 
35, actually 40 categories this year. I created 40 categories that people can choose what books they want to read, like stepping out of your reading comfort zone. So say for instance, a romance novel or a memoir or vintage black feminist tags or speculative fiction sci-fi or a book written by an author from your hometown or a book that centers relationships between women. So the idea is a collection of essays, a collection of recipes, a collection of poetry. You know, I created all these different categories and invite people to just work their way down the list and read things that you may not normally read and read more books by black women writers. Expose yourself to all the brilliance and all the creativity and all the beauty that's out there. You know, think about things from a different point of view, look at life from a different perspective, learn about a different culture. Uh, one of the categories is to read a book that is contains Patois, Creole, uh, some form of African-American vernacular, um, Geechee, Gullah, uh, just, the, just the way that um, the diaspora, the black diaspora sometimes manipulates and changes the English language to me is like very beautiful and very interesting. So I invite people to find a book that contains that and read that. So anywho, I feel like I've talked enough about the challenge. Um, go for it and choose your own adventure. Oh, the other thing about the library, people want people ask me, um, how does it work? So the way the library works is that for every book you bring, you get to take a book, as long as it's written by a black woman, a black femme, or a black non-binary writer. So for instance, you can come to the library with one book and you can walk away with a whole new book. And you can keep that new book and that book becomes yours. So you come to the library with, let's say, Alice Walker's The Color Purple, and you walk away with Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay. Boom. And you get to keep that book, Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay, or you can bring that book back and exchange it for a new book, such as The Autobiography of My Mother by Jamaica Kincaid. And you can keep trading and keep trading. Uh, you can trade two books, five books. I once had a woman show up with 12 books. She walked away with 12 books. Uh, we have graphic novels. We have comic books. We have young adult books. We have children's books. Books about science. Books about travel. Books about finance. Books about hair care. Urban planning. So on and so forth. So it's an interactive social project. I really want people to like come and get involved and touch the books and feel them and hang out in the space and take advantage of our programming. Our programming is always free and the spaces that I have the library in are always accessible, free to get into and safe to be around in, always accessible for people who move differently, people who move with wheels or with walkers or canes, um, small children, elders. It's very intergenerational. I love that. Our last meeting where we talked about Ain't I a Woman, Black Woman and Feminism, which is a book by Bell Hooks that I highly recommend. That meetup had teenagers up until age 60. So I really love that. I love hearing different perspectives, um, conservative folks, queer folks, atheists, um, Christians, Muslims, Afro-Latinx, white people, Asian, um, cis, gender, trans, it's just uh, that diversity, mixing it up to me, just makes it pop. But anywho, I feel like I've talked enough. If anybody has any questions for me, please feel, a free, feel free to put them in the comments and I'll try to answer them. But I'm just going to read a little bit. So this is one of my favorite books. It's called Brown Girl in the Ring, and it's written by Nalo Hopkinson. And Nalo Hopkinson writes what I would call um, science fiction, speculative fiction. Some people might even categorize it as Afrofuturism. Um, and this book in particular, I really, really love. I read it several years ago for the Free Black Women's Library Challenge for the category 
that is called speculative fiction, sci-fi, Afrofuturism, African Jujuism. Um, other authors that you would put under that category would be like Octavia Butler, Tana Reeve Du, N.K. Jameson, uh, Nisi Shaw, Nnedi Okorafor, um, Tomi Adeyemi. Yeah. So if you're into like that kind of like magic and hauntings and aliens and time travel and AI, <laughs> that type of stuff. Um, if you're into like parallel universes and et cetera, et cetera, um, yeah, get into those authors. Um, you know, and then they bring the blackness, they bring the Africanness, they bring the Caribbeanness, they bring, you know, they bring another level to it because, you know, sci fi is something already that's like wild, but then you add in um, black cultural t traditions and um, Af African mythology, and it just takes it to another level. <laughs> Um, yeah, think Black Panther, think Star Trek, think um, a lot of things. But I'm going to read a little bit from the book. And um, yeah, I will say this book was published in 1998. And it's won a bunch of awards. Other books by Nalo Hopkinson include The New Moon's Arms and Midnight Robber. And drop a note in the chat if you've read um, Nalo Hopkinson before. Uh, drop a note in the chat if you like science fiction, speculative fiction, um, myth, mythology, magical, folkloric type stories. Let me know because that's what this is. <laughs> All right. Brown Girl in the Ring by Nalo Hopkinson. Here we go. Let me read the synopsis. The rich and privileged have fled the city, barricaded it behind roadblocks and left it to crumble. The inner city has had to rediscover old ways, farming, barter, herb lore. But now the monies need a harvest of bodies and so they prey upon the helpless of the streets. With nowhere to turn, a young woman must open herself to ancient truths, eternal powers, and the tragic mystery surrounding her mother and grandmother. She must bargain with gods and give birth to new legends. Oh, Nick Boynton says, I've read Brown Girl in the Ring and Midnight Robber Hopkinson is excellent. Oh, great. Yay. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. I feel like enough people don't know about her, so I'm trying to put people on by reading this, but I'm glad that you read these books because I feel like they're so wonderful. And I noticed that I definitely have a soft spot for stories about powered people. <laughs> people with powers, people who can like have premonitions, people with like telekinesis, and people who can shape shift. I'm into that. Um, it's Aquarius season. I'm an Aquarius, y'all. So, yeah. Prologue. Give the devil a child for dinner. One, two, three little children. Derek Walcott, Kazim, and his brothers. As soon as he entered the room, Baines blurted out, We want you to find us a viable human heart. Fast. Blood fire, Rudy cursed surprised is what you are saying he stared at the scared looking man from the angel of mercy transplant hospital up by the burn douglas baines had obviously never ventured into rudy's neighborhood before the pudgy man had shown up in a cheap off the rack bulletproof that dragged along the floor his barrel chest straining at its buttons he looked foolish and he looked like he knew it Rudy watched Baines give Melba the bulletproof. Underneath it, he was wearing a poorly made jacket and a cheap white shirt. Rudy picked at a non-existent bit of fluff on the sleeve of his own tailor-fitted wool suit. His ostentatious lack of protection against attack carried its own message. He was guarded in other ways. Sit down, man. With his chin, 
Rudy indicated the hard plastic chair on the other side of his desk. His own chair was a plush upholstered leather, the color of mahogany. Dane sat, fiddling nervously with the case of his palm book. We need a heart, he repeated, for a, an experiment. We're hoping that your people can help us locate one. Something didn't sound quite right to Rudy. And how come I'm not you know, swine heart? Ain't is that you have all them pig farms for? Yes, well, of course, the porcine organ harvest program has uh, revolutionized human transplant technology. Eh -eh. He talked all official. The way he using all them $10 words, this one going to be big. Rudy leaned his elbows on his desk and steepled his fingers, making the gold ring on his thumb flash. I hearing you. Well, uh, I'm afraid that porcine material just won't do in this case. Ethics, you know. As he heard that spluttered word, ethics, Rudy was suddenly sure that he knew what this was all about. The man was spouting someone else's party line. Rudy smiled triumphantly at Baines. If Utley ain't. Una need a heart transplant for she, and she not let you put no Trenton in she body. Trenton? Pig. Baines looked troubled, then gave a resigned shrug and said, Fuck, I hate this. I just want to do my job, you know? Rudy gazed calmly at the man. As he expected, his silence seemed to fluster Baines even more. Baines babbled. This is all on the QT. You understand? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's Premier Utley, all right. She's demanded a human donor. Says the porcine organ farms are immoral. You know the line. Human organ transplant should be about people helping people, not about preying on helpless creatures, yada, yada, yada says she's confident that if she's meant to have a new heart, it'll come from the human population. Fat chance when almost no one in the world runs human volunteer donor programs anymore. But her position is pulling in the voter support. Polls are tipping in her favor since she started up this God's creatures thing. She might actually get voted back in next year. Baines pursed his lips, shook his head. And it looks like he's not leaving a lot to chance either. More softly, he said, somebody's quietly going to a lot of trouble to have the hospitals procure a human heart for her. It might bring Angel of Mercy good business if we're the ones to pull it off. It could put us back on the map. Rudy put his hand on his bored face. And what have they to do with we? Posse ain't business with politics. It's be a rules thing here now. It was true. Government had abandoned the city core of metropolitan Toronto, and that was fine with Rudy. Imagine a cartwheel half mired in muddy water, its hub just clearing the surface. The spokes are the satellite cities that form metropolitan Toronto. Etibicoke and York to the west, North York in the north, Scarborough and East York to the east. The Toronto city core is the hub. The mud itself is vast Lake Ontario, which cuts Toronto off at its southern border. In fact, when water-rich Toronto was founded, it was nicknamed Muddy York, evoking the condition of its unpaved streets in springtime. Now imagine the hub of that wheel as being rusted through and through. When Toronto's economic base collapsed, investors, commerce, and government, and government withdrew into the suburb cities, leaving the rotten core to decay. Those who stayed were the ones who couldn't or wouldn't leave. 
the street people, the poor people, the ones who didn't see the writing on the wall or who were too stubborn to give up their homes, or who, or who we saw the decline of authority as an opportunity. As the police force left, it sparked large-scale chaos in the city core, the riots. The satellite cities quickly raised roadblocks at their border to keep Toronto out. The only unguarded exit from the city core was now over water by boats or prop planes from the Toronto Island Mini Airport to the American side of Niagara Falls. In the 12 years since the riot, repeated efforts to reclaim and rebuild the core were failing. Fear of vandalism and violence was keeping bird people out. Rudy ruled with his posse now, and he couldn't have cared less about Premier Utley's re-election platform. So, that was the first part of the prologue. Now, this story takes place in Toronto among the Caribbean and Afro-Caribbean community of Toronto, okay? And it takes place in this future when uh, the system has collapsed and is crumbling based on, uh, based on the weather, based on the environment, and the rich people, the privileged people have fleed the city and the city has become a mess. There's no police force. And it kind of reminds me of Gotham <laughs> uh, within the Batman story. Um, it's just like chaos. And there's a, there's a underworld. And Utley, uh, Utley is the government. And Rudy is kind of runs the underworld. And yeah. Um, there's a lot of scientific experimentation going on. Um, there's uh, bodies as capital. Um, so it's giving... Capitalism has just become a beast, more of a beast than what it already is uh, because people are selling and buying body parts. And one of those things is a heart. So continue the story. Here goes. We'll pay for the assistance. Baines named a figure. Rudy was immediately interested, but he didn't reply for a moment. He pretended to be considering. Let the hospital's procurement officer sweat it out a little more. Baines stammered. I, um, I mean, it's not like it's illegal or anything. No laws about human organ donation on the books anymore, right? No need when you can just phone up the farm and order a liver, size three, tailored to fit. Mmm. This is a tough city, right? You people see a lot of terminal injuries. Hmm. Rudy ar agreed wordlessly. Half the time, it's we cause them that amused him. Baines was just coming directly to the source. We're only asking that you call us when that happens, Baines continued. We'll do the rest. Head wounds are the best. Don't want too much trauma to the chest cavity. If any one of them has a heart that's compatible, compatible for the premiere, we'll pay you a bonus. No. That not go work. Just having them come and pick it up easy so. Nah. Go push the price high enough. Rudy took his time thinking it through, figuring out all the angles. Bane tensely tapped ash from his cigarette into the ashtray on Rudy's desk. Melba, Rudy said softly to the haggard, blank-eyed woman who had been dusting around the office. Wipe out the ashtray. Moving slowly, eyes irising in and out of focus, Melba took the ashtray from under Bane's hand, wiped it clean with her dust cloth, and stood holding it, staring into its empty bowl. Thank you, Bane said, smiling nervously at her. 
he didn't respond. Put it back on the table now, Rudy instructed her. She obeyed. She was getting too thin. He'd have to tell the boy to remind her to eat more often. Keep on dusting, Melba. Melba walked woodenly over to a marble coffee table she'd already cleaned three times and resumed meticulously wiping her dust cloth over and over its surface in slow circles. Baines gulped. Rudy smiled at that. The man couldn't even begin to suspect, to suspect what he was dealing with. All right. He knew how this was going to go. He said to Baines, Once my boys find the body, Una have to reach fast, right? Before the person's heart stop beating? Well, yes, but... And what if it's in one of them streets that fill up with garbage or Una gets swarmed by a kid gang? Any delay and you gonna lose your donor. Oh, you might be right, Baines frowned at him worriedly. This is too important to take a chance. Well, Mr. B, I think today is Una lucky day. We have just the fella to set the donor up right for you. Keep the heart beating till you reach. You do? Who? It needs someone with the right training to put the body on ice. Let we just say a ex-medical professional, a nurse. Rudy was pleased that he thought of this. Tony was going to be useful to him after all. The man know him business, he said, unctuously. I think I said that word right. Him was a good worker, just him misfortune that him couldn't resist the temptation of buck, you know? His employers do right to let he go. He does do one one little job for we now, helping you out, you know? While he tried to kick the habit. Well... Maybe, yeah, I guess he could do it. We could supply him with a call button that would bring an ambulance on the double. Yeah, that'd work. He could certainly test the blood type. Baines continued to mutter to himself, ticking items off his fingers. And we could give him the fortified ringer's lactate, laser pen to seal off any bleeders, portable CP bypass machine. Good. I glad you agree. For me think say he could help Una. Excellent. Let me but all like how we take in such a risk, we want you to increase that bonus figure. See? Say another ten percent? Bane sighed. Done. So easy. Briefly Rudy wondered if he should have held out for more. Well, that's how dealing went. Some days you wouldn't win as much as others. Okay, Bain said, looking as though he had a bad taste in his mouth. Don't forget, we only want the flatliners that are in pretty good condition. Healthy. Well before they died. That is, not too much deep tissue trauma. And tell your man we're particularly interested in anyone who's very small framed and has blood type A, B positive. Somebody small. Una could use a child? Like a youth, say? Teen or preteen? Well, yes, we could come to that. None of the street kids, though. Most of them have had buff-addicted mothers. Pity. No one would have noticed a few more of the rats gone missing. Baines opened up his palm book and tapped the keys. I'm requisitioning the equipment you people will need. He scribbled on a business card, swiped the card through the slot in his palm book, then gave it to Rudy. Tell your man to bring this when he comes over to the hospital to pick up the equipment. Today, mind, before four. Then he stood shook Rudy's hand as though he were pulping rotten carry-on. We'll be in touch. 
He picked up his bulletproof from the chair where Melba had draped it. The view off the observation deck caught his eye, and he went over to the window. God, we're a long way up, aren't we? Mm-hmm. You know, I never visited this place back before the riots. Funny how you can live all your life in a city and never visit its main attractions, eh? Rudy didn't answer. Man needed to leave his office now. Let him get on with his business. Baines blushed, pulled up the hood of the bulletproof, adjusted its clear shadow tick drape beak so that it jutted out to protect his face. It was the trademark uniform of the Angel of Mercy Hospital. On the street, they were called the vultures. The price for established medical care was so high that only the desperately ill would call for help. If you saw a vulture making a house call, it meant that someone was near death. Rudy escorted Baines to the door, watched Jay go with him to the elevator. He nodded in satisfaction. He wasn't going to pussyfoot around until they found a compatible donor. He would make sure that Tony got the heart they needed as fast as possible. He turned to the thin, wiry man standing guard outside his office door. Crack, where Tony? Go and find he. I have a job for he to do for me. So, that's the, the end of the prologue. And so, before I read chapter one, I just want to share that one of the things that I think is key to speculative fiction, science fiction, um, African Judaism, Afrofuturism type novels, like anything that falls under that genre, um, hybrid horror, gothic horror, um, is world building, right? The world building elements really pull you into the story. So one of the world building elements that takes place for me in this book that I think makes it such an excellent world that she's built is how she comes up with new language and new titles and new categories of humanity. For instance, she talks about the vultures, right? And the vultures are these people who are rich enough, wealthy enough, privileged enough to have these bulletproof outfits because the crime and the violence is at such an intense level that the only, that the safest way for you to walk in the world, in this world, is to have these beaks and these outfits that are bulletproof. And if somebody is able to have one of these outfits, they're called vultures, the vultures also. Um, another thing um, that shows like an example of world building is the fact that people are actually selling their body parts for money. Um, you have this thing called buff, uh, which is a name of a drug that people are addicted to. So, you know, there's different ways. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. Um, and I, I think that's part of the reason why I like this genre so much is because that world building element really kind of forces you to expand your imagination and completely reject all the notions of the world that you're in and place yourself in this whole different environment. Now, this is a very scary, frightening environment. Um, so, <laughs> you know, if you're someone who doesn't like um, scary stuff, uh, maybe this book might not be for you, but I would say jump in and try and just take your time. So, I'm going to read chapter one, but first I'm going to do a time check. Okay, we're good for time, um, so I'm going to read chapter one, and if anybody has any comments, like how you like in the story so far, um, you can drop a comment in the chat and let me know um, if you're into this story, if it's weird, if it's strange, uh, what do you think about the concept of world building, do you like being portaled into a whole new world it, when you read, or do you like staying in reality? Um, do you read as a form of escape or do you read um, as a way to uh, learn? Um, do you read theory? Do you only read nonfiction? Um, what's your favorite genre? Let me know. Let me know. I'm really into 
interaction and I see that there's 10 people here so drop some titles drop some words in the chat let me know you're out there <laughs> all right I'm gonna read chapter one and then I'm probably going to end there because I don't want to give too much away of the story um, but let me tell y'all this is a good story and brown girl in the rain is a little um, is also a play on the Caribbean um, song. There's a brown girl in the rain. Sha la la la. Yeah. Y'all know that song? Okay, here we go. Chapter one. What can you do, Punchinello little fellow? What can you do, Punchinello little boy? Rainy rain. Tajine could see with more than sight. Sometimes she saw how people were going to die. When she closed her eyes, the childhood songs her grandmother had sung to her replayed in her mind, and dancing to their music were images. This one's body jerking in a spray of gunfire and blood. That one rising as cramps turned her bowels to liquid. Never the peaceful death. Jean hated the visions. Rocking along in the back of a pedicab, she held baby, cradling her child's tiny head in one hand to cushion it from jolting. Undeterred by the shaking of the pedicab, baby was trying to find his mouth with his thumb. Tajine took his hand away long enough to ease the little blue mitten onto his fist. Shaborn Street, she told the pedicab runner, corner of Carlton. No prob, lady, he panted. Wouldn't catch me going into the burn anyhow. The pedicab was at Shaborn and Carlton in a few minutes. Tajine got down, pulled her baby and her package into her arms, and paid the runner. She'd have to walk carrying baby the rest of the way to the bomb yard her grandmother had set up on the old Riverdale farm. The runner moved off quickly, not even looking around for more customers. Coward, Tajine thought to herself. It was safe enough in this part of the burn. The three pastors of the Korean, United, and Catholic churches that flanked the corner had joined forces taken over most of the buildings from here westward to Ontario Street. They ministered to street people with a firm hand, defending their flock and their turf with baseball bats when necessary. Tajine shivered in the chilly October air and hoisted baby higher onto her hip. The package in her other hand consisted of four warm eaten books tied together with string. Her grandmother would be pleased with the trade she had made for the eczema ointment. When she'd shown up to deliver the medicine, she'd found Mr. Reed, self-appointed town librarian, balanced on a stepladder just inside the doors of the old Parkdale Library. He'd been pinning slips of newsprint to the bulletin board. Hey, Tajine, what you think of my display? He'd hop down and move the ladder so that she could inspect his project. At the top of the bulletin board was a hard, was a hand-lettered sign that read, Toronto, the making of a donut hole. He'd cut headlines from newspapers that were 12, 13 years old and pin them up in chronological order. How do you mean donut hole, Tajine had asked. That's what they call it when an inner city collapses and people run to the suburbs, he'd answered. Just a little bit of history. You like it? Tajin had read the headline. Temagami Indians take Ontario to court. Amnesty International funds Temogami Anishinaabe Nabai land claim. Federal government cuts transfer payments to province by 30%, cites international trade embargo of Temagami Pine. Jobless rate jumps 10%. Temagami lawsuit is 
fueling Ontario recession, says Labour Minister. Crime at all-time high, but budget cuts force Ontario Provincial Police to downsize. Toronto Police threaten mass walkout. Job too dangerous. Not enough backup, says Union. Jobs leave Toronto. Seven largest employers relocate. Say Toronto's not safe. Toronto City Hall moves to suburbs. Safer for our employees, says Mayor. Hundreds killed in rapid transit cave in Toronto's Transit Commission blames federal cutbacks to its maintenance budget. Cave in protest sparks riot. Thousands riot. Thousands injured dead. Riot cops lay down arms. Army calls in. Toronto is war zone, says head of police union. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second and go back to this thing I was saying about world building. So here's another example. Um, one element that's used in world building is for the world that, that you create to have its own specific history. And all those headlines are newspaper headlines detailing what has happened in the city of Toronto over the past 13 years. And it talks about the gentrification and then the flight and then the city collapsing, the budget cuts, the transit system coming to pieces, the police system leaving, and the city now is just a war zone. The next two headlines in Mr. Reed's display were written in sm smeared blurry letters on lavender paper. The major Toronto papers jumped ship soon after the army came in, Mr. Reed had told her. The headlines had been taken from the new town rags. Tajine knew the newspaper, a mimeograph zine that someone named Melanie Lewis churned out by hand whenever she could find paper and ink. Temagani natives win lawsuit, trade embargo lifted, too late for Toronto, army occupation of Toronto ends, now what? It's nice, Tajine had said uncertainly, not knowing what else to tell the man. All of that was old time story. Who cared anymore? She'd given him his medicine. In return, he dug through his book stack and come up with an encyclopedia of medical systems symptoms, two gardening books, and the real find, Caribbean wild plants and their uses. Tell your grandmother that I can't give these outright to her, Mr. Reed had said. It's a loan. If anyone else asks for them, I'll have to send for them. Tajine had just smiled at him. Mr. Reed had grinned and shaken his head. I know. I doubt anyone will ask for them either. When Tajine left, he was rubbing the ointment luxuriously into his mustache where the skin was cracking and flaking. Dermatitis, seboric eczema, mommy had called it, before cooking up a nasty smelling paste to treat it made from herbs grown in their garden. Mommy freely mixed her nursing training with her knowledge of herbal cures. Tajin, tell he to stop drinking that elderberry wine he does brew. I think that is what's irritating he lips. And tell he to stop smoking. Tobacco does only aggravate eczema. Tajine just hoped the ointment would work. Sometimes the plants mommy used had lost their potency or perhaps were just a weak strain. Too sometime-ish for Tajine's taste. She slipped some vitamin D tablets and a tube of anti-inflammatory cream into Mr. Reed's package. Mommy still had lots of that kind of stuff left in her stockpile. Paula and Pavel had set up their awning at the corner of Carlton and Sherburn, next to the shack from which Brookfoot Sam sold reconditioned bicycles. Braces of skinned, gutted squirrels were strung up around Paula and Pavel's awning. Tajine could smell the rankness of the fresh raw meat as she walked by. It must have been the morning's kill. The couple had claimed the adjacent Allen Gardens Park and its greenhouse, which they farmed. In the winter, Paula and Pavel were the burn source of fresh vegetables for those who lacked the resources to import them from out city. 
and the overgrown park hit a surprising amount of wild game, pigeons, squirrels, wild dogs, and cats for the not too particular. Paula and Pavel defended their territory fiercely. Both brawny people, they each had a large blood smeared butcher knife tucked into one boot. Warning and advertisement. Nobody gave them much trouble anymore though. It wasn't worth the personal damages to try to steal from the well-muscled pair. Rumor had it that those who crossed Paula and Pavel ended up in the cook pot. Besides, vegetables and fresh meat were scarce, so people tried to stay on Paula and Pavel's good side. Those who lived in the burn were still city people. Most preferred to barter or buy from the couple rather than learn how to trap for themselves. Hugely pregnant, Paula was arguing the price of two scrawny squirrels with two gaunt young women who had their arms wrapped possessively around each other. They'd probably take the meat across the street to Lenny's cook stand, where for a price, she'd throw it onto the barbecue next to the unidentifiable, unidentifiable, un, unidentifiable flesh she skewered, cooked, and sold for money or barter. Good evening to Jeannie. Pavel called out as she went by. He and his wife Paula had been lecturers at the University of Toronto before the riots changed everything. We got something for your grandmother, leaves from that tree. Soursop, I think she calls it. Yes, Tajini replied. Mommy would like that. Soursop leaf tea had made a gentle sedative and the old greenhouse was the only source of the tropical plant. Good, Pavel said. Tell your grandma we'll be by with them later, eh? We'll trade her for some cough syrup for our little Sasha. Tajin nodded, smiled, looked away. In the 11 years since the riot, she'd had to get used to people talking out loud about her grandmother's homemade medicine. Among Caribbean people, bush medicine used to be something private. But living in the burn changed all the rules. Tajin walked past Church Row. An old woman bundled into two three bit into two threadbare coats sat shivering on the steps of the Catholic Church. Maybe from the icy fall air, maybe from a buff trance. The heavy oaken door opened and Pastor Masanui stepped out. His black shirt and dog collar gave him a formal air, despite his packed jeans. Hello, Pamela, he said to the old woman. Some lunch for you today? She turned her head slowly, seemed to be having trouble focusing her eyes. R -r -r Reverend, I'm hungry. As Tajin walked by, she heard Pastor Messenger say, All right, dear, but you know the rule. Give me that knife first, then a bath, then you eat. The next place Tajin had to pass was Whoop Sing's Roti Parlor, Caribbean and Canadian food. Nervously, she eyed the twitchy huddle of men hanging out in front of the roti shop. Krapau, Jay, and Crack Monkey hustled us all, liming to the next job, looking for trouble. She knew them well from her days with Tony. She had always managed to be very busy in Tony's rooming house kitchen when they came to visit. And of course, there was Tony, liming with them. She would have to bump into him on her first excursion since baby had been born. Tajin sped up slightly. Tony looked at her. Did she hear him softly say her name? No. He and Crack had put their heads together whispering about something. Tony didn't look too pleased at what Crack was telling him. Tony was trying to catch her eye. She could feel the pull of his gaze. She risked another glance at him. His features were as fine as she remembered. Skin smooth as hot cocoa, square jaw, full well-defined lips, deep brown eyes. Baba's eyes, oh, baby's eyes looked just like that. She should be ignoring Tony not staring at him like this. She sidestepped a flock of gulls that were fighting loudly as they picked 
at a near frozen orange bollock on the ground. Probably the sour remains of last night's meal that someone had vomited onto the sidewalk. Pulse thumping, she began to edge past him and his friends, trying to seem very interested in picking her way through the garbage on the sidewalk. As Tajine walked past the men, Crack Monkey called out to her, Hey, sister, it's time to get to know one another better, you know? Big joke. They all laughed, though Tony's voice sounded nervous. I say, Crack hollered, It's time I get to know you better. The men's mocking laughter spurred Tajine to move faster. She hugged Baby closer to her and scowled at Crack. Tony glared at him, too, but she knew Tony wouldn't say anything to his boss's right-hand man. Abruptly, the visions were there again. Tajine froze, not trusting her eyes any longer to pick reality from fantasy. She was seeing crack monkey, a wasted thing, falling to the ground and gasping his laugh. No one around him would care enough to try to help. Crick crack. Monkey break, he back in a ham sack. Krapaus, the old South, in a rundown privatized hospital. Finding the strength to scratch fitfully once more at his bed sores before his final ratty exhalation. exhalation. His sphincters would make a wet, bubbly noise as they released their load into his diaper. Cause of death? Metabolic acidosis, cirrhosis of the liver, rum. Down by the river, down by the sea, Johnny, brick a bottle and blame it on me. Jay, killed by love, rang to the aid of his sweetheart, a transvestite hooker who would be attacked when her John realized he was actually a man and pulled a knife. Jay's death would come from a belly wound. Tajine was sure that no one in the posse suspected that Jay was anything but arrow straight. Riddle me, riddle me re, riddle me re, guess me this riddle, give me, guess me this riddle or perhaps not. Oh, it's 7.51, so I'm going to be closing in nine minutes. Tajine couldn't see her own death or baby's. She couldn't see Tony's death, not anyone close to her. And she didn't see blind crazy Betty until the woman was right in front of her, sightless eyes turned toward Baby, who was snuggled into Jean's arms, happily gumming the mitten on one tiny fist. That is my child! He's mine! shouted the bag lady, her wrinkled arms reaching to pluck Baby away. What you doing with my baby? You can't make a child pretty so? You didn't never want he? Give me to me! The old fear of madness made Tajine go cold. She jerked baby out of crazy Betty's reach. Alarmed, the child began to wail. Mad woman in front of her. Hard-eyed men just behind. But at least the men had something behind their eyes. Some spark of humanity. Tajine chose. She turned and ran back the way she came. Hey, Tajine! Tony reached for her arm. She yanked it away, pushed between Tony and Krapow's. She dragged the door open and ran into the roti shop. The warm, fragrant air on her face was a shock. How come she was outside? And why was it warm? Tajine looked around her, then jumped as she felt Tony's hand on her shoulder. Tajine, what's up? You all right? She didn't answer. She appeared to be in a green, tropical meadow. A narrow dirt path ran through it, disappearing in the distance as the road curved gently downward. The scent of frangipani blossoms wafted, wafted by on a gentle breeze. Baby stopped fussing. A figure came over the rise, leaping and dancing up the path. Man like man tall on long, wobbly legs, Look as if they hitch on backwards. Red, red all over. Red eyes, red hair. Nasty, pointy, red tail. Juking up into the air. Face like a grinning African mask. Only it's not the mask. 
the lips then moving, and it have real teeth behind them lips, attached to real gums. He waving a stick, and even the stick self paint up red, with some pink and crimson rags hanging from the one end. It's dance he dancing on them wobbly legs, slapping he knees in and out, like if he drunk, jabbing he stuck, he stick in the air. And now I can hear the beat he moving to, hear the words of the chant. Ja, 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 ja. The jean shrank back, trying to hide baby's face from the terrifying sight, where he trotled and stretched baby's fat hands out in the direction of the jab, jab. Tony had more sense behind her. She could hear him whisper, God almighty, what the hell is that? The jab, jab turned its appalling grin of living wood in their direction. It hopped right up to the three of them split its wooden lips wide and hissed in their faces, a hot, stiff wind. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. That is page 18, so there's like a little break in the book. So I didn't read the entirety of chapter 1, I just read the prologue and about half of chapter 1 of Brown Girl in the Rain. A book written by Nalo Hopkinson that takes place in a whole new world uh, within Canada, um, Toronto, and it takes place in the future. And I don't know if you caught the gist, but Tajine is the main character, and she has a couple of special powers. One of them being that she can look at someone and see how they're going to die. Um, she has visions. And she hates the fact that she has these visions. Um, she feels somewhat haunted. Um, she also has a baby. And she also has a grandmother who's an herbalist uh, and a conjure woman. And there was a time in the city that they're living in where they hid their spiritual practices, their conjure practices, their use of herbs to heal the body. But since the city has collapsed... Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Boynton. I appreciate that. Um, they are now using their um, the tools of the trade in public. So her grandmother is a herbalist, and she is also a herbalist healer, herbalist healer. And um, since the city has collapsed, the police is gone, and life as we know it is chaos. Uh, they don't use money anymore. They barter. They do trade. So. Grandma and Tajin, they trade medicines, ointments, lotions, oils, tea, salves. Um, they trade them for other materials. And one of the things I enjoy about the book is that it starts out where they trade medicine for eczema for books. Hey, right? So um, I'm really interested in community care. I'm really interested in nurturing and fostering and spreading um, the concept of community care and um, the different survival practices and survival strategies and communal practices where we aren't necessarily um, engaging in capitalist ideas. And I feel like bartering and trading is one really excellent way to do that. Um, instead of counting on the almighty do dollar, um, sharing our knowledge um, sharing our brilliance, our creativity with each other. Um, I'm a yoga teacher, and sometimes I trade yoga classes. Um, I actually do have a Patreon, uh, pay, uh, Patreon, and the funding from the Patreon is what covers the expenses for the library. So if you would like to support my project, please consider becoming a patron, Patreon patron, please. Um, I would be so grateful for that. Um, money goes to cover all the costs for the library you can join for two dollars a month five dollars a month ten and as a thank you to my patrons i offer free yoga classes every week um so i'm interested very much interested in that um collective care model of bartering and trading um trading babysitting for somebody to do your hair um trading a meal um for babysitting um trading uh, somebody, a uh, tutoring session, uh, for a music lesson, you know, different things like that. I mean, I feel like every single person on the planet has some spe something special to offer to the community, 
And I think that it's an excellent way to just explore um, that idea. So that's one of the reasons why I enjoy the book is because like money, what's money? Um, so I think part of what she's offering here is when it comes to like the fall of these um, capitalist structures, there could be some pros and there could be some cons. <laughs> if capitalism fell tomorrow and the almighty dollar um, became worthless, what would we do to survive? Um, how would we take care of each other? How would we look out for each other? How would we uh, build community? How would we engage in commerce, right? Um, if the dollar meant nothing. And I, for one, would be part of that tribe that is into skill skill swapping, barter and trading, sharing, books, clothes, food, herbs, flowers, um, beauty products, <laughs> all that stuff. You know, it's like, I'll bring you three bars of soap that I made if you're going to, you know, give me that delicious uh, gluten-free bread, like four loaves of that bread. <laughs> you know, so, anywho. But, yeah, so I appreciate that. Um, but if anyone has any questions for me, please feel free to drop them in the chat. If not, I'm probably going to close out in about one minute. And I do thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you would like to join our reading club, send me a DM, follow me on Instagram. I'm at the free black woman's library, all one word, the free black woman's library at me. And I just want to wish everyone a happy black history month, a happy 22. Uh, may you be loved. May you feel healthy. May you feel safe. And may you find a community that nurtures and bigs up and enjoys, uh, all that you have to offer, all the goodness that you, um, as well as a community that, that challenges you to open up your mind and think differently and think expansively. And yeah, hooray, hooray for um, Black feminism and what it brings to the world. So I'm going to tune out. So I guess that's it, y'all. Bye, guys. Thank you. Now, who wants to teach me how to close the chat? <laughs> Figured it out. Good night, guys.